in three, two, one minute. Hey, hello everyone, and welcome for another Vision Web Seminar. So summer is finally upon us. So we have only two online talks left, and then we will leave the stage for the Retinal Circuit Symposium that will take place at the end of the month. And then we will finally take the month of August off and take some vacations. So we will be back on mid-September. So I can only encourage you to subscribe to this channel if you do not want to miss any future talk. As usual, I'd like to remind you that these online events are part of the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. So while you enjoy your vacation, maybe try to watch some of the podcasts. You will find all the relevant links in the description. Today, today we are very happy to receive Professor Timothy Brown from the University of Manchester. Based within the Center for Biological Timing at the University of Manchester, Timothy established his own grouping in 2012 and has since focused on the control of circadian rhythm and the effects of sing visual signals on physiology and behavior. Timothy's ongoing research activities combine large scale multi electrode recording approaches alongside intersectional genetics tools for neural circuit mapping and whole animal physiological measurement. These activities have contributed to significant advances in our understanding of the sensory control of the circadian rhythm such as, is, as influences of daily changes in the color of daylight around dawn and dusk, as well as revealing an aesthetic aspect of more conventional vision, like the contribution of melanopsin photoreception and binocular processing in the visual talus. So those are all very interesting topics, but I think the best will still to hear about them directly from you. So hello, Timothy. Thank you for accepting you. the invitation. How are you doing today? Good, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today about some of our work. So I'll just bring my presentation up. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so so thanks for the introduction. Um, so what I really wanted to talk to you today is about some of the work we've been doing over the past few years relating to uh, processing of color signals in the mouse brain. And uh, particularly, I want to talk about some of our recent stuff to do with um, color and, and conventional aspects of vision in mice. Uh, but first of all, because I think it helps to provide some sort of useful context for understanding why we've done what we've done, and also hopefully because it's interesting in its own right, I'm going to say a bit about the beyond in this title here, by which I mean um, sub subconscious um, aspects of how retinal output influences physiology and behavior. So um, in, in the introduction, you just heard, obviously, a major interest of mine for a long time has been the circadian system. And really, that's how I became interested in, in vision and the visual system in mammals. Um, so around about that time, when I first got interested in this area, which is, I guess, 15 years ago now, maybe, um, this idea had emerged of kind of two parallel visual systems in 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 the mammalian brain um, so obviously are what i might call here conventional visual systems so output from the retina um, so going to the lateral geniculate nucleus and, the, and supporting thalamocortical visual processing and also obviously associated accessory projections to superior colliculus etc um, but Obviously, at the same, uh, around that time when I became interested in this, a really important discovery for us in the circadian field was the identification of these uh, intrinsically photosensitive melanopsin expressing retinal ganglion cells. And at that time, it seemed that this specialized class of retinal neuron specifically projected to parts of the brain involved in, in subconscious effects of. Uh, light on physiology and behavior. So in particular, projections to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the site of a central clock regulating circadian rhythms, um, projections to the, the pretectal olivary nucleus, which obviously controls the pupil, and also some projections to parts of the thalamus, the intergeniculate leaflet and ventral LGN, which are also involved in circadian and other processes. Um, so because, because these brain regions that, that at the time seem to be the, the main targets of the IPRGCs uh, are generally considered to be uh, mediating these subconscious responses to ambient light intensity, but 
more sophisticated aspects of, of visual processing, the ability to distinguish form and motion, etc., weren't considered to be so relevant to these. This kind of gave rise to the idea of this non-image forming visual system, which involved the IPRGCs. And, and essentially that the IPRGCs are a specialized class of retinal ganglion cells that provide information about ambient light levels and regulate these subconscious responses. Um, so that's kind of where I, I, I became interested in this area. And uh, I, I guess it's fair to say that now that this distinction between image forming and non-image forming visual systems is a bit less clear cut than it once was. Uh, but nonetheless, even back in, in, in those days when I first started working on this, uh, it was certainly apparent that melanopsin didn't account for all aspects of non-image forming vision. So just like any conventional retinal ganglion cell, the IPRGCs in the retina, yeah, they've got their own photoreceptor melanopsin, but they can also receive signals from the rods and cones. And so in the circadian field, there was a lot of interest in understanding what, you know, why is this? What, how do signals from the rods, cones and melanopsin combine to dictate the sensory properties of, a, of the circadian system? And obviously this is important in practical terms because it was well established that um, kind of the daily patterns of light exposure that we tend to experience nowadays um, potentially disrupting our clock. So if we could understand the sensory control over circadian rhythms, then maybe we could devise lighting systems that were better for our overall health and well-being, et cetera. And obviously to do that, you need to know the sensory properties of the photoreceptive input. Um, so that so we wanted to, to tackle that problem initially. And obviously doing that is actually kind of challenging. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so hard is because if you look at the spectral sensitivity of the different um, opsins in, in the retina of a mammal, um, they, they overlap quite significantly, particularly in, in the nocturnal rodents that people were mainly using for studying the circadian system. So for example, here you can see the spectral sensitivity of the opsins in mice. Um, so like most mammals, they've got two cone opsins, an S cone opsin and an M cone opsin. Um, and those are relatively well separated spectrally, but you can see that all of the other opsins, melanopsin, rods, M cones, they all overlap very strongly. Um, and so for that reason, if you're using the sort of conventional approaches that people tended to use, so you're comparing sensitivity to monochromatic light of different wavelengths, makes it very difficult to separate how, what each of these different opsins is contributing to the response. And so obviously, one thing you can do if you're using mice is use transgenics. And so obviously the, a lot of our insights have come from studies where people have knocked out either opsins or aspects of the phototransduction cascade of rods or cones. And that's definitely produced some useful insights. But really what we wanted to be able to understand is how signals from these different opsins were interacting in the intact retina. And that's quite difficult to do if you're knocking things out. Uh, but fortunately, uh, some time ago now, uh, Jeremy Nathan's lab developed this, this really useful mouse model uh, where they took the, the native M cone opsin and replaced it with the human L, L cone opsin. So um, I'll refer to these as red cone mice. Um, so um, actually, you know, by generating these mice, um, J Nathan's and co were able to, sh to show some really interesting things about how uh, color processing might work and evolve in in animals. Uh, but for our purposes, they were just really useful because it gave us this, this really nice uh, spectral separation between um, the, the M or now L cones and rods and melanopsin. And so what we could do then is by using multi-primary visual stimuli. So in this case, we've got three LEDs with peaks in the UV, blue and orange part of the spectrum. Uh, by adjusting the relative intensity of those those uh, three different primaries, we're able to produce pairs of stimuli that um, differed in brightness for one or more opsins of our ch of our choice, but appeared of identical brightness to the other what we would call silenced opsins. So this is the silent substitution approach that's been quite popular in human psychophysics. 
Um, so so we, we applied this to, to these red cone mice and that allowed us to generate stimuli where we could uh, selectively modulate, for example, just the L cones or just the LS cones, or we could uh, modulate them in unison, for example, increase brightness for both LMS cones simultaneously or change brightness for the two opt-ins in antiphase to produce changes in color, um, all while keeping signals from melanopsin and rods silent. Uh, so this is really important then, it allowed us to get at this question of what cones might be contributing to um, the responses of, of the circadian system in mice initially. Um, so to look at that, then we performed multi-electrode recordings from from the SCN in mice, anesthetized mice, this is. Um, so we, we, for these experiments, we tend to use these uh, Buzaki style um, silicon probes. Uh, so we have four shanks, each with eight closely spaced recording sites that we can insert into the SCN. And then um, based on the, the kind of signature wave for electrophysiological waveform we see on adjacent recording sites, that allows us to isolate individual neurons with pretty good reliability. Um, so in, in conjunction with those stimuli I just showed you, which allowed us to modulate um, the activity of specific cone classes, and we could also do it for melanopsin, it wasn't shown on the, on the slide, but obviously we, we could also look at what happens if we modulate melanopsin signals to these cells. So we could get, get at that question of how, how the different sources of photoreceptive input were combining to dictate the response of SEN neurons. And, um, Obviously, at the time, our understanding was that essentially all of the retinal input to the SEN was coming from the IPRGCs. And sure enough, we found that all of those cells pretty much showed evidence of melanopsin-based responses. Uh, but what about cone-based responses? Um, so certainly, most, if not all of them, responded to our cone isolating stimuli, uh, but we found different types of responses. So. Quite a lot of cells responded, as you can see in this example at the bottom. So um, they would show excitatory responses to steps in brightness, selectively targeting either the L or the S cone opsin, and those signals combined. So if you stimulated both opsin types in unison, you got a bigger response. Uh, if you stimulated the antiphase, you got a slightly smaller response. Um, but more interestingly, we also found other cells that behaved like this. So they showed this kind of classic opponent behavior, for example, showing an inhibitory response to selective stimulation of the L opsin and excitatory responses to selective stimulation of the S opsin, or in some cases, vice versa. Um, so as evidence that this is kind of your prototypical uh, response to color, um, what we found is that if we modulated activity of the two cone types in antiphase, so this would produce a large change in apparent color, that is the ratio of L to S opsin activation, without changing the net brightness for, for the two cone types together, those cells would show very, very large modulations in firing. Whereas if we modulate the two cone types in unison to produce an achromatic change in what you might call uh, illuminance, then the responses are very small. Um, so, th so we found robust color responsive cells in the central clock. And there were quite a lot of them. So all in all, somewhere in the region of a third of the cells we recorded had these color, color sensitive responses in the, in the central clock. So that led us to ask, well, obviously, there's information about color here in the clock. Why is it helpful? And the obvious reason why it might be helpful, given that the idea, the goal of the clock is to align rhythms in the animals, physiology and behavior to changes in the outside world. Um, if you look at what happens to, to the spectral content of ambient illumination around dawn and dusk, it's not just the amount of light that changes when the sun goes below the horizon, but also it's spectral content. Uh, for example, as you can see here, uh, when the sun's below the horizon, there's a strong loss of these middle wavelengths. Um, which is caused by that light having to pass through more ozone before it reaches us when the sun's below the horizon, and that selectively filters out that, that band. Um, so to us as humans, this, this appears as a kind of blue shift in the color of, of twilight, and that's true also for, for most mammals that have um, diachromatic visual systems. Um, so for example, you can see here the native mouse M and S cone opsins 
well positioned to detect that spectral change. So obviously, in that sense, there's information here in the spectral content that could tell the mouse what time of day it is in the outside world. Uh, but really, the, 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 the value potentially of, of color in that obviously measuring the amount of light can also tell you what time of day it is. Um, is what happened if, if you look at what happens on clear and cloudy days. So, so we took data uh, recorded in Manchester between August and October um, for ambient illumination and broke it down into clear and cloudy days. And what you can see here is that obviously if it's cloudy, that can have a big impact on the, on the overall level of irradiance that you might experience, like a tenfold reduction easily. Uh, but that the relative spectral content is quite similar so um, this difference between twilight and day daytime is re is retained whether it's a clear or a cloudy day um, so that sort of tells you something about why color might be useful then if you were just relying on measuring brightness to figure out the position of the sun if it was a, a cloudy day your estimate could be out by you know your estimate of sunrise or sunset might be out by 45 minutes or so compared to a clear day whereas that doesn't happen if you're measuring color so our thoughts then were that probably by combining information about brightness and color that enhances the the ability precision with which the clock can infer the position of the sun and in in later studies we went on to to provide evidence for this uh, so I'm not going to go through all the data from this uh, relatively recent paper in detail, but just to give you an idea of the kind of things we did, um, we we generated a, a kind of a housing environment for mice where we could change the spectral content of, of ambient illumination presented to animals in their home cage. And then, for example, we could do things like this. So we could change between uh, pairs of stimuli where the brightness for melanopsin and rods was identical, but the relative activation of S and L cones was skewed one way or the other to make the illumination appear relatively yellow or blue. Um, and what we found was that bluer colors evoked weaker responses, weaker circadian responses in the mice. Uh, so an example of that is shown here. In, in this particular example, we kind of simulated jet lag by um, maintaining mice under a light dark cycle and then shifting the time of the day. And we found that if we made the day's color blue resembling twilight, it took them longer to reset, to realign their activity than if we made the days appear yellow, more better resembling day. And we confirmed that effect was due to cones because if we do the same thing in mice that lack the cone specific uh, cyclic nucleotide gated channel, that effect disappears. Um, and in, in this study, we were also able to actually recreate um, naturalistic daily patterns of illuminance, including or lacking clouds and including or lacking color. And using those kind of approaches, we we're able to actually um, provide some strong evidence in support of the hypothesis I just outlined that essentially what's happening here is that by combining signals about color and brightness, it helps to buffer the clock against this kind of effect of stochastic variations in brightness due to clouds, which render light intensity and an ambiguous time of day. Um, so color enhances the precision with which the mouse clock can tell what time of day it is. Um, so given, given uh, that data showing this um, regulation of the circadian system, which is obviously entirely dependent on signals from IPRGCs, um, has a, a major contribution of color. We were interested in determining whether color signals might be also be important for other IPRGC driven responses in mice. And obviously the, the kind of prototypical response that a lot of people have studied um, is uh, control of the pupil. Um, so pupil responses are known to be dependent on IPRGC inputs. So for example, in uh, this nice study from Gula et al, in Nature 2008, where they lesioned the IPRGCs genetically, um, they found major different deficits in light-dependent pupil constriction. Um, and I guess more to the point, there's a number of studies now, uh, here's one very nice example from Manuel, Manuel Spitzchan, have shown that pupil responses in humans involve uh, a, a, an S-cone opponent effect. So there's a color 
influence on human pupil responses. So we're interested to determine, is, is that true also in mice? Um, so as a starting point to look at that, we performed electrophysiological recordings, similar to what I've just told you. But now, rather than recording from the SCN, we're recording from the uh, livery pretectal nucleus, which is obviously the, the main central relay regulating pupil responses. Um, now, for these studies, obviously, we know that IPIGC projections to the, the pretectum are important for regulating the pupil. However, unlike the SEN, where all of the retinal input is coming from IPRGCs, as you can see here in the top panel, uh, IPRGC inputs labelled in green and conventional RGC inputs labelled in magenta, um, in the pretectum, there's there's a lot more input from, from non-IPRGCs as well. So this is a study from, from uh, Bayer et al. 2020. Um, so in, in that sense, um, really what we wanted to do when we were recording from the pretectum is find a way of specifically identifying those neurons that were getting input from IPRGCs rather than um, conventional RGCs. And so to do that, um, we designed a pair of stimuli um, that had identical brightness for the S and L cones in, in these red cone animals, um, but differed very greatly in their ability to activate melanopsin and rods. So somewhere in the region of a 500 fold difference in brightness. Um, so we, we really wanted to, to produce the biggest difference we could with these stimuli, because as some of you will probably be aware, it's it, as our understanding now of the IPRGCs is there's lots of different types, some of which don't have very much melanopsin. So we really wanted to give us ourselves the best chances of, of possible of being able to distinguish cells that even had small amounts of IPRGC input. Um, that being said, then the challenge with, with the approach we've used here is because we're also presenting stimuli with a big difference in brightness for rods. If we see kind of differences in response to these two stimuli, how do we know whether they're coming from melanopsin or rods? Um, and so the approach we took was to present these as discrete light steps from darkness. The idea being that provided they're sufficiently bright, even the melanopsin low stimulus should drive transient rod saturation. And, and basically that approach works. Um, so evidence of that. Um, here you can see a bunch of the, the neurons from the pretectum that we recorded that we designated as melanopsin responsive. And you can see something kind of very consistent in their response. So this is the same population of neurons tested across three different uh, log space light intensities. And essentially what you can see is the initial component of their response to the light step is pretty similar for the melanopsin low and the melanopsin high, but then a difference in the response appears over later components of the stimuli. And this, of course, matches our understanding of how melanopsin works in quite a sluggish manner. So um, it takes you know 500 milliseconds or so for the responses really to become apparent. And so we have a sort of nice intrinsic control here where we can look for cells where the initial part of the response doesn't differ significantly, but the later components do. And just evidence that what we're seeing here really is a melanopsin effect and not a rod effect. We can do the same thing in melanopsin knockout red cone animals. And we found that though that kind of sustained component was, was massively reduced when we did that, the experiment in, in those animals. Okay, so, so these, these cells that we identify that, that seem to get input from IPRGCs or show evidence of melanopsin dependent responses, we call melanopsin responsive. And so we could then look at that population of neurons and say uh, how, do, how the cone signals influence their activity. And so here's the, the average responses of, the, of those group of neurons. And once again, just as in the SEN, we found that you could split them down broadly into three types of cells. So down at the bottom here, there are some that show excitatory responses to um, both L and S optin stimuli, or or in some cases, just responses to one and no response to the other. Uh, but importantly, we can we can confirm these have sort of conventional non-opponent type responses by virtue of the fact that 
when we stimulate both opsin types together, they show a large response. And when, that, when we stimulate the two opsin types in antiphase, they show a smaller response. And then, of course, by, by distinction to that, we can also clearly identify opponent type cells. And I should, uh, I think I forgot to mention earlier, but we're referring to these cells that show inhibitory responses to L opsin and excitatory responses to S opsin. So S on, L off. Uh, we refer to them as blue on by analogy to the kind of uh, the color channel in humans that this this replicates. Um, so we can also find blue on cells and yellow on cells here in the in the pretectum among cells that seem to be getting input from IPRGCs. And similar to what I just told you for the SEN. Among the cells that respond to these stimuli, and we find a small subset of neurons that don't reliably respond to these cone isolating stimuli. But among those that do, again, about a third, in fact, in this case, maybe even slightly more than a third, are color opponent. Most commonly blue on, but also with some yellow on cells in there. And then uh, this little panel underneath is just to show you that these color opponent cells were all found within. Uh, the pretectal livery nucleus, PON, and intermingled with the non-opponent cells. So they're certainly found within a part of the brain where we might expect them to influence or contribute to pupil responses. Um, before I leave this, also just to make the point that in these experiments, we, we specifically confirmed that uh, our, our kind of silent substitution approach was not misleading us and resulting in off-target responses, for example, mediated by rods. Um, so we wouldn't expect rods responses per se because we present, first of all, because nominally there's almost zero rod contrast, and secondly, because we present these at high brightness level where we would expect rod responses to be suppressed. But nonetheless, to confirm that we aren't getting rod responses, we also applied the same stimuli in coneless animals. And as you can see here, whereas we get robust responses in both the normal red cones, and the red cone melanopsin knockout mice, there's no response to these stimuli at all in the coneless animals. Um, so, so they're definitely cone mediated. Okay, so anyway, moving on, um, there's, we've, there's abundant evidence of color opponency in the PON. Does it influence pupil responses? Uh, so that's what we looked at next. So we used this identical stimuli, although we presented them in a slightly different paradigm. So for the, the things I've shown you previously, we're presenting kind of square wave modulations at um, 0.25 hertz. Here, to, to look at the pupil, because the response is a bit more sluggish, we present these contrast steps where we, we give a step up for five seconds and then step down for five seconds or, or vice versa. And what you can hopefully see here is that um, if we if we modulate brightness for just the L or the S cone opsin, uh, we see very similar responses in that increases in brightness are associated with pupil constrictions and decreases in brightness associated with pupil dilations. So much as you would expect for the pupil, uh, but no evidence of any opponency in here. And indeed, you know, further indication that that's the case is that if we modulate uh, brightness for the two conopsins in antiphase, so this S minus L condition, we didn't actually find any significant pupil modulation. Whereas if we modulate brightness for the two opsins in unison, we get big, robust pupil responses. Um, altogether then, what we found was that essentially the, the L and S cone signals are combining in an additive rather than subtractive manner to regulate pupil responses in mice. Um, and um, actually, that seems to combine with melanopsin signals. So in this in this further panel here, what we're doing is uh, we're we're providing a spectrally neutral change in brightness of the same contrast um, as this L plus S opsin stimuli. And what you can see is that that actually results in bigger responses. And if you look at the time course of of how this changes and compare the the, the L plus S condition to the all opt-in condition, you can see that for the initial couple of seconds post change in light step, responses are the same, but then the all opt-in condition gradually deviates, suggesting this kind of slowly building up melanopsin contribution that I kind of alluded to in the electrophysiological data. Uh, so to summarize that, that first bit then on non-image forming responses, um, 
I guess what I've hopefully convinced you is that color potency is very widespread across uh, brain regions that are target, uh, targeted by IPRGCs and, uh, and play key roles in non-image forming vision. So about a third of the cells in the SEN and about a third of the melanopsin responsive cells in the PON have color opponency. Most commonly this is blue on, but there are also some yellow on responses in there. Uh, what I didn't kind of talk about in much detail is the potential origin of these responses. Um, it's definitely known that there are some subtypes, or at least one subtype of our IPRGC, the M5s, that have blue on responses. And there's also some evidence that some M4 IPRGCs, um, which seem to be synonymous with on alpha RGCs, could exhibit color opponent responses if their receptive fields are located in the middle part of the retina. Um, but there's also the possibility that some central processing is underlying what I've just told you. And maybe, you know, if people are interested, we can come back to that at the end. Um, uh, in terms of the function of color opponency, that's become a bit, uh, well, in the case of the SEM, we have a good idea. So I showed you that um, color signals adjust circadian responses to brightness to provide a mechanism for compensating for the effects of clouds. In the POM, we don't see an effect of color, which is surprising given obviously the best known role of the POM is in regulating the pupil. We don't see an effect of color on that. Um, so we assume then that these color signals relate to other things that the POM does, which are not that well defined, but include effects. Uh, on, on eye movements and potentially also contributions to circadian control. Um, but anyway, for, uh, moving on from the non-image forming stuff, um, I guess we're still interested in these questions and pursuing them in the lab, but for the rest of today, I wanna cover uh, another question we asked, which is, is, is this uh, widespread appearance of color in non-image forming processing um, just indicative of a general widespread role of color in all aspects of mouse vision, or is it something selective to the non-image forming responses? Um, so in terms of color in mouse vision, uh, it's been known for some time that mice can discriminate colors. For example, this is a kind of force choice wavelength discrimination task uh, reported back in 2004 uh, that showed that mice can distinguish um, ultraviolet from longer wavelength light. And more recently, a very nice study from Denman and co um, under, in a kind of immersive virtual dome uh, setup showed that mice can perform color discrimination and particularly they can do it re relatively well for stimuli appearing at high elevation, so above their head, but not so much for things appearing below the head. So there seems to be some sort of spatial inhomogeneity in terms of where mice can discriminate color. Um, what I guess has been a bit controversial is the mechanisms underlying this or wavelength or color discrimination in mice. Um, so many of you will probably know that the mouse retina is kind of unusual in that there's this very strong gradient of conops in expression such that in dorsal parts of the retina, most of the cones just express the airmopsin, uh, whereas in ventral parts of the retina, you have some cones that just express the S-ops in and other cones that co-express both types. Um, so there's not much overlap in terms of the regions where you get pure S and pure M cones. And so um, that's sort of thought to be a limitation on mouse color vision, although it's worth saying that plenty of studies have found evidence for spectral opponency at the level of the retina. Uh, I briefly mentioned a couple of them. Um, Here's another really nice, extensive recent study from Katrin Franker's group, um, where they they uh, use kind of imaging techniques to to look at um, color processing at all stages of the retina. And this is for retinal ganglion cells. Um, they found lots of cells that showed evidence of opponency to full field um, violet and green spectral modulations. Um, particularly in the ventral parts of the retina, so these redder colors here. Um, so in particular, what, what they did was they found that four, four stimuli presented just over the cell's receptive field or, and, and adjacent regions. Um, they didn't find many cells that were opponent for that, but um, 
they the bi they have a chromatic bias between center and surround so for example in this neuron you can see center stimuli it's it's violet biased and surround stimuli it's green bias which gives rise to this kind of full field opponent type response and that's also been common of other um other studies that have looked at opponency in the retina it seems to involve generally surround mechanisms so for example here's another nice study um which looked at a specific RGC type, the JRGCs, and they found that in central and ventral parts of the retina, many of these have UV off centers and green on surrounds. Um, and of course, because there seems to be a lot of this opponency in ventral parts of the retina, where there are very few pure M cones, it's, uh, I guess an idea has emerged that maybe rods are playing a particularly important role in, in color discrimination in mice. Um, so that's really, we wanted to look at the extent to which cones might also be uh, playing a major role in driving color responses in the mouse visual system. And to get to that, we use the same kind of stimuli I've just described, but now we're recording in the mouse LGN. Um, so just to remind you, uh, the DLGN, uh, which is where we mainly targeted with these recordings, is the main thalamocortical relay, but we also did some recordings from the IGL and ventral LGN parts, which are involved in the scaling system. Um, so we applied our, our stimuli and um, in keeping with everything I've told you so far, we, we found quite a diversity of different types of responses. These are just four example neurons. Uh, but basically what we found was you can find plenty of neurons that aren't opponent. Um, so they either respond to just S or just L or sometimes a combination of both. But we also found a good number of cells that showed opponent responses, for example, yellow on illustrated here on the top row and blue on on the bottom row. Um, uh, so here's data from a whole bunch of neurons we recorded in that, in, in that kind of approach. So um, in particular, we found over 400 that responded to our cone isolating stimuli. And you could see based on the response to the to L and S only stimuli and L plus S versus L minus S, we're able to cluster these into yellow on, blue on, and non-opponent on and off types. Um, and this is just kind of population data from those, those um, groups of cells to illustrate the point that for the non-opponent cells, they typically very strongly bias towards one opsin class or another, most commonly S-opsin, but obviously there are also L bias cells. Um, so on, on the panel on the right, you're sh I'm showing contrast response functions for single opsin stimuli and the the magenta is the preferred opsin and the, the, the green is the non-preferred opsin. So you can see very little response to the non-preferred opsin, strong responses to the preferred opsin. And if we stimulate both opsins classes together, L plus S, um, we get just slightly bigger responses than the L minus S because these are essentially driven by just a single opsin. By contrast, among the opponent cells, they're also often quite biased towards the single opsin. But in this case, you can see the, the L minus S chromatic stimuli produces way, way, way bigger responses than the L plus S achromatic cone modulation. So strong indication that these are color opponent neurons. Um, and as you can see here, we find good numbers of both yellow on and blue on cells. Um, so, um, so there's plenty of color processing going on in the LGN. We next wanted to get at the question of whether there was some kind of anatomical order to this, because uh, obviously uh, we were recording across all different sub regions of the LGN. Um, we first of all looked at across all cells, regardless of whether they were opponent or not, um, whether there was a relationship between their anatomical location and their preference to um, L or S cone opsin stimulation. So essentially here, a minus one means pure S opsin driven responses, plus one means pure L opsin driven responses. And what you can see is that actually there's a strong segregation here. So in the DLGN, dorsal regions are very S opsin biased, um, whereas medial um, and ventral regions are more kind of equal um, L and S. Um, this obviously, to some extent at least, matches the known retinotopic um, arrangement of projection to the LGN that have been reported previously. Um, 
But more to the point here of interest, if we break down where you find the opponent and non-opponent cells, you can see that the opponent cells are very strongly localized to this medial portion of the, of the LGN complex and the non-opponent cells found in surrounding regions. Um, now, this interested us because, of course, if you look at where the IPRDC projections to the DLGN go, so obviously, I told you at the beginning that originally we thought that IPRGC selectively innovated um, non-image forming structures. We now know that, that some subtypes of IPRGC is also projected to the DLGN, and that seems to align quite nicely with where we find the color opponent cells. So is melanopsin or IPRGC input providing the dominant source of color processing in the LGN? Uh, so we use those same melanopsin um, melanopsin high, melanopsin low stimuli I told you about before, um, and that allowed us to identify melanopsin responsive cells. Um, but actually, we didn't find any real difference. So um, essentially, among cells that responded to our stimuli, in both cases, about a third of the neurons are color opponent. The big difference between the MR and the non-melanopsin non responsive cells is that in the latter, many more of them just didn't respond to our cone isolating stimuli, probably because they're more tuned to other things like spatial properties, etc. But in any case, it certainly seems to be the case that um, melanopsin input is not directly predictive of the presence of color opponents. Um, we next wanted to um, get sort of more insight or, or to better confirm that what we were looking at really is a, a cone dependent response rather than um, off-target responses, for example, involving rods. So I already showed you some validation in the pretectum. Here we use the stimulus um, ro called RodMel that we designed to, to provide 45% contrast for rods and melanopsin, but zero contrast for S and L conopsins. And we then compared it to 45% contrast stimuli targeting S, L, L plus S, L minus S, et cetera. And as you can see, in all cases, the cone stimuli produce, produced robust responses across all the different classes of cells. We never saw any response to the rods stimuli. Um, so under these conditions, which is high background light intensity, it's definitely not rods that's driving the responses. Um, we also looked at the stability of the cone driven responses across different background light levels. Um, and here you can see that those responses are present across backgrounds between about 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 15 log photons, which broadly correspond to the kind of light intensities a mouse would experience at, between, at solar elevations between minus six and plus six degrees. Um, so, and also obviously aligns with when you would expect cone responses to be biggest. Um, to look at whether rods signals become more important under these lower light intensities, we also in these experiments compared um, L plus S cone modulating stimuli with the all opsin stimuli. So this is providing contrast, not just for cones, but also for rods and melanopsin. And in none of those cells did we find a difference in response to the two stimuli. Uh, again, suggesting that rod contributions across this range are negligible. Um, further evidence of that, um, is provided here. Um, so for the interest of time, I'm going to skate through this, but essentially we designed a new stimulus set which allowed us to selectively modulate rod S and L opt-in stimuli uh, activation um, in a kind of white noise type paradigm. And basically this kind of recapitulated what I've just told you. We occasionally saw some evidence of, of rods um, rod responses in the spike triggered averages at low light intensities, but we never saw any evidence of rod cone opponency directly, whereas we could clearly see um, L S cone opponency in, in the cells previously categorized as yellow or blue on. Um, okay, so hopefully I've convinced you with that bit that we're finding widespread and robust cone opponency in the mouse LGN. We next wanted to see um, dig into the kind of spatial properties of these responses a bit. Um, so we started off by looking at the, just the receptive field locations of the cells, um, estimated in a rather crude manner by presenting flashing white or black horizontal or vertical bars at various places across the visual field. Um, 
And although obviously these stimuli are in principle not optimal for modulating color opponent cells, uh, we're actually fully able to identify receptive field locations for, for the yellow on and blue on cells using this approach. There was a ten there was a tendency for, for yellow on cells to have on type receptive fields to these bar stimuli and blue on cells to have off type receptive fields, although that wasn't in, always the case. Um, but the important point was that we could estimate at least receptive field locations for a good amount of cells using this. And then we could look at whether there was a relationship between the, the retina, retinal location of the receptive field or the visual location of the receptive field and the cone-based response of the cells. Um, so on this central panel, then opponent cells are indicated by a star, non-opponent cells by a diamond, and the color indicates their cone preference. Um, so what you can see here is that obviously at higher elevations, uh, there's strong SOPs in bias, which obviously corresponds to the SOPs in dominant ventral retina. And at lower elevations, the preference becomes more towards the elopsin, as you would expect. Um, and indeed, if, if we plot the average cone preference as a function of elevation, you can see this nice gradient there. Um, we didn't see any, any variation on the azimuth axis, although most of our recordings come from the, the locations corresponding to temporal parts of the retina. So there may be some variation if we recorded more cells out here. Um, the most important thing I want you to get from this though, is that if we look at the relative proportions of color opponent and non-opponent cells across azimuth or across elevation, we didn't actually find any evidence of a significant variation. So color opponent neurons are found throughout all of the regions that we recorded from, um, which on the elevation axis corresponds to approximately 30 degrees below to 30, 40 degrees above the retinal midpoint on the dorsal ventral axis. Uh, so the, the central 60 or so degrees of the visual field, essentially. Um, um, we also um, wanted to look at the idea that maybe these opponent responses were originating simply by random sampling. So I guess those of you that have followed the color field will know that um, one, one of the proposed mechanisms inv involves center surround based sampling where the surround just happens to sample from a different population of cones to the center. So um, this indirectly can give you some form of color opponency. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna have to skip the details of this slide, but suffice to say that in modeling to, to produce a situation where we got the, the equivalent number of opponent cells to, to that we found in the actual data, um, this required that the surrounds of the cells be very strongly strongly weighted so essentially the surround was almost as strong as the center and it resulted in the situation where essentially all of the opponent cells would be found in the dorsal retina which is or uh, with receptive fields in the dorsal retina which is not in, not exactly what we found in fact it, to, um, we found almost the opposite so we don't think random wiring alone can fully account for what we for the responses we've seen, there must be some kind of selective wiring going on to account for the responses. Um, so final little bit of data then, um, we more directly wanted to look at the receptive field properties of, of the color opponent cells and the cone specific receptive fields. Uh, so to do this, we adapted a projector system originally described in this paper from Annette Allen. Uh, so it's a five primary, um, DMD based projector system. And by using these, this five primary system, we're able to produce stimuli where we could present flashing squares, where we, for example, presented an, an L opsin increment on an L, L low background or vice versa, or an S opsin increment on, a, on an S opsin low background or vice versa. And so using this approach, we were then able to map receptive fields of some of, some of the cells we found. And uh, here's just some example, non-opponent cells. So for example, LS on, L off, L on, LS off. But we're also able to find a bunch of cells with clear opponent receptive fields. So for example, here are two examples of yellow on cells. You can see L on and overlapping S off receptive fields in the same retinal location. And similarly, here are two blue on cells. You can see the L off receptive fields and S on components in the same visual location. 
Um, so this is a bit different to what people have seen in the retina. Um, seems to be uh, an opponent center based mechanism rather than that kind of uh, surround based mechanism that most commonly be seen in the retina. Um, we did also, though, in these experiments, provide full field flashes of, of L and S opsin isolating stimuli to ask whether there are additional color opponent cells to be found. And indeed, we did see that. Um, so um, here's, here's two examples of cells where our conventional receptive field mapping didn't show, uh, show any opponency. But when we delivered the full field stimuli, we clearly see L on S off or S on L off. Um, so all in all, um, we found about a third of the neurons in the LGN had cone-dependent color opponency. Among that, there was a pretty much equal mixture of yellow and blue on responses, but also there was an almost equal mixture of cells that had this kind of opponency for small, discrete, spatially localized stimuli versus cells that only showed opponency to full-field stimulation. So um given given that a lot of what we see here in the LGN is 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 a bit different to what people have been reporting in the retina where people have rarely seen strong center-based opponency it's interesting to speculate that maybe there are sort of central mechanisms at play giving rise to this very widespread opponency in the LGN uh, but nonetheless what what we can say for certain is that color opponent cells are are strongly enriched within the LGN, particularly in the medial portion. Their receptive fields span at least the central plus or minus 30 degrees of retina. And collectively, this is providing a kind of diverse capacity for color discrimination across the central and upper visual field that operates across twilight to daylight light intensities. Um, and that uses cones. Um, so I think I should end there. I should, I'll just acknowledge the people that, that did the work. So Josh Mooland, current postdoc in the lab, Ed Hater, a PhD student, uh, Abby, a PhD student, and Lauren, a previous postdoc, all, all did aspects of what I've spoken about. Thanks. Well, thank you, Timothy. That was a very interesting talk. So, thanks a lot for that. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, if they have a question, they can ask it directly to the chat or they can join us directly in a room through the link I just shared on the chat. So we're waiting for your, que for your questions. Um, I have a couple already. Uh, so I have one from Tom Baden. Yeah. Is there a light intensity dependence difference between the L and S cone responses in LGN neurons? Um, okay, that's a great question. So it sort of it depends on on because obviously all everything we've done is modulations with respect to a background, um, and. Um, so where we where we give stimuli on a background that resembles natural daylight for a wild type mouse, like the ratio of L to S ops in activation, um, when that matches what a wild type mouse's experience of natural daylight, the intensity range is pretty similar. Um, now, one of the things I presented, I, I had to go through it slightly quickly because I realized I was running out of time. Apologies for that. Um, for the white noise stimulus paradigm we tested, uh, in order to make that work so we could pre present rod selective contrast as well as cone selective contrast, we had to adjust the spectral composition of the background um, and make it much more skewed in favor of the L-opsin. And there, then we saw this shift where there were some intensities where we could see an L-driven response, but not an S-driven response. Um, so in simple terms, I don't think there is I don't think there is a major difference in the intensity range they operate at, but you sort of have to bear in mind the background spectral composition. If, if, if you're looking at just responses to modulations on the background, it depends what background you're starting from. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Christian Puller. Yeah. Oh, Christian. He says, great talk. Thank you. What is your idea of selective circuitry? in particular for opponent signals coming from ventral as dominated retina? Um, so, I, well, so in terms of selective, selective circuitry, I think all that's really required is like S, I think S cone specific pathways, S cone bipolar cells are probably enough. And the surround, like a surround component 
can come from um, the mixed M plus S cone population because it's because because of the way opponency works as a subtractive mechanism. As long as there's a difference in where where like you have one pure like a pure S center, then the 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 greater M bias of the surround would be enough to give you a surround type opponency. Now for the um, for the cells we find in the LGN that seem to have this kind of center opponency, um, I, the reviewers of our paper wanted like were keen that we steered away from saying center opponency because they rightly pointed out that maybe it's it's hard for us to directly distinguish surround and center in these experiments, which is fair enough. Um, but my feeling, well, I, I have a suspicion that maybe what we're looking at here in the LGN is actually generated centrally, or at least it need not come from the retina. Um, so in that case, if you have like a retinal ganglion cell providing pure S signals or even S biased signals and another providing um, M by signals, perhaps rooted by uh, via a inhibitory interneuron, or perhaps just an off versus an on ganglion cell converging onto the same LGN neuron, then that could generate everything we see. Um, I think that's you know an interesting possibility. We certainly know that LGN neurons receive input from more than one retinal ganglion cell, um, so so that could definitely happen. Um, in terms of if it was happening in the retina, I don't know. I'm not the expert here, but I don't think people have. I don't think there's like an an M selective bipolar cell, and uh, obviously you've still run into this issue that I alluded to at the beginning of my talk of there are very few pure M cones in the ventral part of the retina. Um, um, following up. Um, the, sorry, I lost it. Uh, it's somewhere. I have another question from uh, Tom Baden. I mean, you kind of covered it already. It's uh, regarding the opponent receptor fields that you showed earlier in the LGN. Yeah. Um, are the green receptive fields bigger than UVs? I think he's referring to the third picture you showed when you had a big green. Yeah. Um, no, so for all the cells where we, I, I didn't put this in my presentation, apologies. For all the cells where we had, where we had receptive fields for both S and L, we didn't find, there was no significant difference in receptive field size between the, the, the L component and the S component. Um, I didn't actually specifically look across just, I didn't specifically look generally, um, but obviously I can do quite easily um but i think it was just yeah just a random example um so obviously you know in in terms of receptive field sizes you see a range in the lgn um like our, because of the nature of the stimuli we were delivering um i think we may have been slightly biased towards detecting cells with the smaller rather than larger receptive fields but um I think most of the ones I showed you had approximately six degree diameter receptive fields, and certainly you can find cells in the LGN with like 20 degree receptive fields in some cases. Um, Thanks for that. Uh, sorry, I think there was a follow up. Uh, isn't type 1B6 sort of M selective? Uh, isn't type 1 bipolar cell kind of? L selective, M selective. Um, I'll have to pass on that question. I'll take your word for it, probably. Yeah. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. Christian has <laughs> answers the question mm. on the chat. So yeah. um, thanks for being interactive, people. I'd Thank like you. to remind you that um, I have one last question and then I will close the stream. So if you want to join us, uh, do that now. If you want to be able to do that after I terminate the session. So we have uh, for you, Timothy, we have one more question from Catherine Franca. Yeah. Hello, Catherine. Uh, great talk. Uh, can you elaborate on differences in color opponency for different stimuli, but for the same neurons? For example, full feed flashes versus full feed flicker and special RF mapping. Um, okay. So for, for for the full field stimuli, we that, you know all of the neurons we tested with our kind of like our standard 
square wave modulation and the white noise approach. And we found a very close correspondence in terms of um, opponency found under those different conditions. Um, in terms of the receptive field mapping and full field stimuli, we did find there were some cells, actually some of them cells where I showed you the center opponency or apparent center opponency, particularly the S on cells, cells that had an S on center and apparently an, S, an L off surround or sorry, an L off cent, uh, center, um, often didn't respond to full field stimuli, suggesting they, they have quite strong surround suppression. So they might even be double opponent, I don't know. Um, it's quite hard for us in the LGN to, to see evidence. You, we don't tend to see strong surrounds in the LGN. So, um, but they responded, yeah, they responded under the spatial stimuli, not under the full field. So um, hopefully that answers your question, sort of. Well, I guess I can only invite Kathy to join us later yeah. on so we can elaborate on this. Um, Thanks again, Timothy. That was very interesting. Very nice for you to for showing up. Um, for the other people, uh, well, I guess I'll see you next week for our last uh, talk. It's going to be hosted by um, Karen Carlton from Maryland. So, thank you all. See you next week. <laughs>